and welcome to Indian Time Peace and Kuskadlich. Welcome to our show again. And today we have uh, the two place names for today I'm going to use is Sinchadle. Uh, Sinchadle, and I guess is a full word, Sinchadle, which is uh, Vandenberg, down there by Vandenberg area. Down there by the mouth of the Vandenberg, there used to be a, a place they called Sinchadlem, and where they were uh, waiting to, uh, uh, they heard there was some uh, um, some enemy tribe in the area, probably the Blackfeet, and this was in one of the areas that they waited the, 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 um, to ambush the, the tribe there, the Blackfeet. So they called this Sinchadlem. And you come further east, and then you get to uh, uh, Magpie, the Magpie area. And this is called Quatskisa, uh, uh, we call it. Now we shorten everything anymore. Quatskisa, the hat of Magpie. And it was named after a person that lived there many years ago. His name was Peter Magpie. So that's what we call uh, Van, or Magpie, Quatskisa. Those are the two place names that we're going to have for today. And uh, I'd like to remind everyone that uh, this is the month of uh, uh, choke cherries. It's uh, pretty easy to say, uh, as I will ask my guests to say later on. It's very easy. And that, that's choke cherries. Uh, choke cherries are both dark and red, and they grow on, on tall and kind of tall bushes, or I guess is what it is. It's called bushes, and it's uh, one of the uh, foods that the Salish Pondere people picked uh, to, for their winter supply. And this was getting towards the and, and the fall, getting close to winter. So they were going around doing their best, getting all the berries and getting it ready. Also, they would pound the berries, the choke cherry berries. You'd see some of these old stones and with a grinder and a pounder, they would pound them and then they would sun dry them. And then the berries could be kept for a long time. And then later on, you could uh, make some soup out of it, mix it with uh, flour, or before that, they mixed it with deer broth or, or some kind of a broth and, and that made a good soup. Um, also, it was a medicine. You said the roots were used for a medicine for your stomach uh, illness. If you had didn't feel well, the roots were cooked and drank as a tea. Um, this time of the year, there was also other plants, other berries that were picked for the winter months. Uh, the wild uh, wild grapes or tzatz was another uh, berry that was picked. Um, the other one is you could eat that fresh or you could dry it also, uh, and smash it up and dry it, sun dried. A lot of things were sun dried too, so you could keep for a long period of time. Also, this time was the elderberry, the tsquik, tsquik, uh, elderberry. If you remember a while back, uh, we used to, we called plains tsqui. Uh, which means place of the elderberry. Uh, in the past, uh, there used to be a, uh, an abundance of elderberry in that er area. So September is the month of people gathering the, the last of the berries and getting ready for the winter months for their winter supplies. So it was a pretty busy t time for the, the Indian people. Uh, also in, this, in September, a few things that took place in September. On the, on the 1st of September uh, in 1880, the Chamawa School opened. Uh, it's a boarding school in Oregon that a lot of our people went uh, to boarding schools back in those times. They were sent off to learn trades. And uh, boarding schools, as you know, has a, a long history, some good and some bad. And, uh, in future shows, I covered the uh, boarding schools, not the boarding schools, but the Jesuits at one time. And we can come back and cover that uh, subject again. I know there's a lot of people that really fully don't understand uh, the, the, goods and, the good and the bad of the boarding schools. Also, on, um, on, in 18, 1805, on September the 5th, um, 
the uh, Salish scout spotted the approach of Lewis and Clark expedition at Kutilhatsudle, which means a great opening, great clearing, which is down by Ross's Hole. So on, on, um, on um, September 5th, 1805, another change was coming for the Salish people in this area. And a lot of the, in the future months, we'll be talking about the, the effects and the impact that Lewis and Clark had on the Salish people. Uh, in, on September 7th, 1873, uh, Chief Arley and some of his followers left the Bitterroot Valley for the Flathead Reservation. Uh, that left uh, a few of the uh, uh, Charlotte followers remain in, in the uh, Bitterroot Valley. And also on uh, September 7th, on 1883, the Senate committee headed by Senator George Vest arrived uh, to invest the conditions of the Flathead Indian Reservation. On September the 23rd, 1841, the St. Mary's Mission was established by the Jesuits near Tlatlmich or Stevensville. And we will get into that. That was the very first uh, I guess mission in this area, the Jesuits moved here in 1841. But as I told in the earlier story, the Jesuits were brought here, uh, were, were sought after by the Salish people to enhance their uh, medicinal powers that the Salish people already had. And they, when they heard about the De Jesuits, they thought that by bringing them here with their prayers and things that they, they thought that it would and give the Salish people would get more power in war and some of the things that they needed more of this power. Anyway, as it turns out, uh, the Jesuits' uh, arrival here, their intent was to replace the religion and the beliefs that the Salish people had. So after a period of, uh, of about eight years, there was some um, uh, conflict between the Jesuit and Salish because they did not intend to give up their own. They were asked to give up their medicine bundles, and, as, and the, at that time, the medicine people took their bundles and they went, went underground to practice. So after about eight years, the uh, Jesuits left here and went to eastern Washington and built the first St. Ignatius mission on the, uh, near the Kalispell tribe or the lower Pend Oreille, which is there in Usk, which is now Usk, Washington. And they stayed there uh, uh, till uh, they built, they moved from there because uh, things didn't work out, the location wasn't right. There was a lot of flooding in the, at that time in that area. So they, then they moved back here to St. Ignatius, which is now St. Ignatius, in 1854, and built the historic church that you see now. That historic church was built by, from baked um, clay uh, that was baked just uh, south of St. Ignatius, um, right out there by where Penny Kip now lives uh, in that area is where some of the ovens were located and a lot of the uh, uh, Indian people in that area helped uh, with the building of the church. They, they hauled the bricks from out there back to where the church is now uh, in wagons and that's when the church was built in 1854. Then in 1855, um, during the Stevens Treaty, there was a, uh, the, the misused the information. Um, also back in, back, going back to 18, uh, 1841, uh, where they thought, or 1849, when, they, when the, the Jesuits left from the Bitterroot to go to, uh, go to uh, Eastern Washington to build, relocate there. Uh, the other conflict that was there was uh, at the same time they built, the, the established a church in 1841 at Stevensville, they were established in church up there in the Blackfeet country. And at that time, they, the, the Blackfeet and the Salish were still enemies. So that, was, that added to the conflict of establishing a church there also. 
Um, so that's something that we can talk about uh, in the near future. I'd like to remind the people that um, in, on September the 13th here, which is kind of coming up very soon, we're going to have our fall, uh, annual fall trip to the medicine tree down in Stevensville. And so for those of you that are interested, uh, we leave the longhouse at 9 o'clock, and it's pretty much an all-day trip. We go down there and have lunch, uh, mostly lunches on your own. Uh, if it's a nice day, people bring uh, sack lunches and eat out there in the open. Uh, a lot of people like to stop on their way back in Hamilton at the coffee cups, and they have some great selection of pie there, so you might want to stop there. And then on the 23rd of September, we will be going down on our, our annual uh, pilgrimage to also back to the Stevensville, to the church down there where uh, our ancestors, a lot of our ancestors are buried and down there. It's still the cemetery at Stevensville. We'll be going down there on September the 23rd. Uh, mass is hopefully be at noon, and right after Mass we have a, a, a dinner with some of the people there from the community there. Uh, we have a, a dinner and then <clears throat> we're all done. But starting next year, we're hoping that next year we're going to try to get people interested in what we used to do in the past, is that after the Mass and after the dinner, we would stay around and uh, have a couple of drum groups there and some dancing. We used to have quite a few dancers back there and, and some drumming, so we're trying to get that back uh, up, going again. So if you're interested, keep that in mind that next year we'll try to contact some drummers and dancers. With that, <clears throat> again remind you that the place name is uh, uh, um, which is Vandenberg, and uh, which is uh, Magpie. With that, I want to introduce my uh, guest today. She was a re uh, guest just recently, but she did so well that time, I, I wanted to do bring her back again. Uh, Penny Kipp is uh, going to talk about uh, PIR Day. What is PIR? And whatever else she can tell us about that. So I'd like you to welcome Penny Kip. Thank you, Tony. You're really going to make me say that? <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, again, it's um, September. School started. And with that, we um, open up our activities and welcoming back of school students um, by giving them a day off, by taking their teachers into the classroom. Um, PIR is a pupil instruction related day for teachers. And what that basically means, Tony, is that the teachers are sent to class seven days a year. And through a lot of um, discussion, a lot of uh, conversation, and uh, a lot and a lot of calendar setting, the local um, schools, the principals and superintendents, have um, got together and put uh, a calendar together that says, okay, on this day, we will let the tribes um, have a day to tell us about them. And approximately 450 teachers attend. Wow. So um, this year it will be September 14th, and it's at the Polson High School. The... Um, Agenda is is always just packed with um, people from our res natural resource department, our culture committees, um, the um, skills and knowledge of many of our community people to come in and talk about some arts and crafts, to talk about our fisheries, our wildlife, our biologies, map making. Tribal council will again be there to do a panel, and. Um, there will be, um, a pro it'll be 48 sessions this year. Some of them will be duplicated. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit, I wanted to talk a little bit about our um, keynote for the year. Our keynote for the year is um, Michael Acapa. Um He has written a wonderful book and um, 
the book will the um, this book is um, one of many that he has written, illustrated, authored, and published. And he is um, a wonderful storyteller. I was fortunate enough to attend one of his sessions and um, over in Helena. And at that time, a group of us got together and said he has to come over and he has to tell um, stories for us um, to, our, to our kids. So um, we are looking forward to having um, Michael, he, he just puts you in the mood to listen to good stories. This, and he's written um, several others. Um, and and I'm, off the top of my head, I, I can't even begin to tell you any of them. Um, and I won't go there. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he is, um, he'll be in the schools all week. He'll be here, as a matter of fact, this coming Sunday and starting Monday, we'll be hitting the ground and running through the schools and doing six sessions in the schools that he'll be um, attending all week long. Then he'll be ending with our keynote at the PIR day. And then we'll be um, doing also four sessions for us at our PIR day, um, where there's a group of approximately 40 teachers who she will talk about mm. and tell stories. Um, Great. OK, we're going to take a short break here, and uh, we'll be right back. Native Americans cherish their bodies. Good athletes take good care of themselves on the field and in the gym. But what about after the game or the workout? Do you know how to protect yourself from STDs and AIDS? This is real life. It has real consequences. Welcome back to Indian Time. Today, my guest uh, is Penny Kipp. Uh, we're discussing PIR Day and what PIR Day means and what it is. Penny, just before uh, break, you talked about uh, the, your guest speaker. Uh, what, what, what more can you tell us about this gentleman? Um, Michael Lacapa. He is um, a Hopi, Navajo, and Tiwa. Um, from Arizona, um, and he, him and his family have just, it's kind of a joint venture with him from what I gathered from when I saw him. Um, just does do wonderful work, talk about real current events, current issues that kids face um, when, they, when they're writing books. Um, one of the, um, he wrote two books, two award-winning books, um, and they're Antelope Woman, and people who read children's literature will definitely know that one, and the flute player, and um, a new one that was a new one, an older one that was out called the um, Mouse Couple, which is another popular one. Um, Michael does wonderful storytelling. Uh, he'll um, he'll make you laugh. He'll make you cry. He'll just really um, make you feel like. Um, you're part of his story. He can be having a conversation with you and then go into the storytelling voices, as we know great storytellers can do, and, and just um, buy you into his whole um, story. Mm -hmm. um, Michael will be, like I said, working within the schools during the week and then doing our keynote and then um, be doing some sessions for us. Um, the other thing that we're hoping, Tony, is to be able to schedule a little bit of time for him to come in and do the show with you. That'd be great. Oh, he's That'd be here. Great. Um, I wanted to. Um, I just wanted to touch on this book a little bit. It's about a little boy named Tony, <laughs> 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 who um, wants to know when his when he um, finds out he starts to look a little different than his friends. One's darker, one's lighter, and he's saying, you know, what what's what's up with that? And and uh, his friends say, oh, it's because you're um, I'm Indian and, and you're you're half or maybe less than half, you're, you know. And so his question, like many of the kids on our, in our schools and on our reservation and our families say, what does that mean to be less than half? And so this is a, a nice little illustration to talk to kids about that and um, be beautiful illustrations. Mm -hmm. um, back to the PIR day, um, we're going to be having um, like I say, the keynote and then the four general sessions. 
and they'll be starting in the morning, about 10 in the morning. And public is welcome to attend, come in and take a look and see what your teachers are doing for the day and what they're learning. And um, maybe possibly be a presenter next year. It's our opportunity as a tribe to talk to the teachers and, and let them know what's available, what our resources are for our classroom use for kids. Um, classes will go from 10.10 until noon, and then again at 12.20, 12.25, and we'll go again until 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, so basically what it is is different programs come in just sharing what resources they have for teachers, uh, mm -hmm. future teachers, or the teachers for the school year, right? Mm -hmm. Resources, activities. Um, some of the programs come in and say, you know, if you're studying this, this is a, a piece that we can come in as a department or as a program and, and tell you what, um, how we can use this or how you can use our skills in your classroom. Um, well, this year, we're um, ending our um, PIR day with a whole general session again. At the beginning, we, we all start out together, we break, then we break out into our session, then we come back together at the end. Dan Decker, who is a tribal attorney, is scheduled um, to come and speak to us for the last hour, hour and a half of the day. Um, every year he does a, a session on tribal sovereignty and he talks on current events and things that are happening within the tribe at this time, um, talks about some real basic understandings about the tribe, um, kind of breaks some of the stereotypes and myths that some of the teachers, or I can't say teachers, but the general public um, might have about um, working with um, Indian children. And Dan's gonna come in and do that whole hour and a half session because his sessions, just about every year, a standing room only, um, people are on the floor and up against the walls and, you know, trying to get in there to hear Dan's um, talk. Um, so this year I'm hoping to begin an every year um, thing with Dan where he comes in and closes our session and talks to us about our current events and, and happenings. And so everybody will be able to hear it. And I've heard him probably, oh, it's probably about the sixth time I've heard him and every time I hear him I Oh, wow, I didn't know that. <laughs> There's something else new. He does a great job. I've had the opportunity to work with Dan a couple of times, and, and, and he does a really great job. And I think that, especially for the new teachers that have arrived here in the Valley in this last year or so, I think it's important that he hears the people, I mean, the teachers hear this. And I think not only because it's a, it helps them understand um, where they're at and where they're living, but also it, it helps them, I think, in many ways, understand the differences in, in uh, uh, the cultures to understand maybe a better understanding of the Native American Indian children and, and the obstacles and the things uh, that they go through without realizing that you know, the young people, as they grow up, they're, they're all colorblind, and as, as they get older, and I blame not necessarily the kids, Where did, you know, because they have to learn from adults a lot of the negatives. Uh, so as they grow up from, and they, they, you see, you watch kids at a young age playing together out there in the schoolyard, having a lot of fun, and as they get older, they start to separate. They start to, to see, uh, talk about differences, and. Uh, difference in opinions and those kinds of things, but I, I think that people that, that that work, play, and live on reservation need to need to hear this. You know, uh, it's not necessarily uh, something bad. It's just something that is part of who we are as as uh, Indian people. It's a, you know the treaty and the sovereignty all all part of it and. The more you learn about it, the more you understand, the easier it is for everyone to be here. So, yeah. could, uh, you, you want to talk a little bit about maybe just a couple of the sessions, and maybe what kind of sessions you're talking about? Sure. Um, like I mentioned, Tribal Council, um, and, and I'm putting them on the spot right now because I'm saying they will do it, and I haven't been in to ask them. I've talked to a few of them individually who, for the first time last year, came in and did a panel, and they talked about um, how are you elected? What's the election process? 
Um, why, are, why are there 10? Um, um, how do you get to represent who you represent? Um, from which district and how many from each district? Those kind of things. Mm -hmm. Real basics about tribal council. And then um, they talked about some of the issues that they're faced with on a daily ongoing basis. At that time, they also invite classrooms to come in and watch the tribal government at work. And um, I understand a few classes have been in this last year, and, and it's, so it's, that invitation has been working. Hmm, great. Um, another one will be, um, oh, let me find a fun one. Um, we're, um, one whole session, one whole um, session number four will be all to the arts. Um, we're still looking for somebody who can, um, and if you're out there, please <laughs> call me. <laughs> um, we're looking for somebody to do flutes, somebody who can pick up, you know, and, and show teachers and art, or shop teachers how to possibly make a flute for their, you know, in their classroom, you know, not, not in 45 minutes, but that, that um, session. Um, the flutes, um, beating, drumming, singing, teepee construction, um, hmm. all the different um, basket making, um, we're going to just try and throw all those in just one whole session so everybody has a chance to do and come out with some kind of arts. Great. That sounds good. And I think we're just about out of time and, and we'll go ahead and start. Uh, I think we'll close here. Remember the two words, the two place names again is in Chakhadle, which is Vandenberg, and Qatskhisa, which is Vandenberg. Or Magpie. Qatskhisa is Magpie. Uh, so I think this uh, PIR day, although it's a, it seems like there's a lot crammed into to one little day. I mean, it's something I hope that uh, will be beneficial to our children in a in a long way, in a long sense. It's going to benefit our children if we can uh, communicate well with the teachers now. Then throughout the year, our children. Uh, we'll be able to communicate well with, with their teachers. So with that, I would like to thank my guest, Penny Kipp, for dropping in again. Uh, she does such a, a great job. Uh, who knows, she might be here next show. Uh, but again, <laughs> thank you, Penny, and uh, hope to see you soon. <laughs>